So, Carol, uh, we are really uh, excited to have Carol Sokoloff with us. Carol is a, uh, a wonderful person. He's become a really good friend of mine. And um, But his record, even I didn't realize, his record goes back 30 plus years of uh, macroeconomics, figuring out worldwide trends. Any big trend that you have seen in the last 30 years, Carol has identified and um, and um, uh, uh, and writes about it in his uh, um, uh, weekly publication. What I've learned and uh, what the street's telling us. And uh, so, Carol, uh, maybe let's focus on some of those big trends that you have um, um, uh, been able to identify and um, and uh, talk about it to us. Thank you. Well, Prem, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's, I can't imagine a group that I would more rather be talking to than value investors, because <clears throat> I'm the ultimate contrarian. And uh, being a contrarian is a very lonely place to be, and it's hard to run a business being a contrarian, but it's my passion. So <clears throat> I'm most happy when I'm the only person doing something. Um, I think it would be interesting is to talk about the signals that I've used uh, as an indicator. So one of them is buy when they're giving it away. When I say give away, I mean literally giving away. So it's 1977. I'm walking up the streets of Manhattan with a guy who is, works for U.S. Trust. He is a uh, trustee of this estate. He said, today we sold a triplex on East End Avenue for $1 because the maintenance was too high, $3,000 a month. At that time, you could buy a townhouse in New York City for $40,000. But they were giving it away, literally giving it away. So fast forward, uh, then we had uh, double-digit inflation, uh, double-digit interest rates. Uh, stocks were selling way below breakup value. 13D, the name of my company, is uh, a filing with the SEC if you buy 5% of a public company. So I got involved in that. <clears throat> we had about 180 of our investments taken over. Uh, you need a catalyst, in this case it was Mike Milken. <clears throat> then the next thing was very interesting. Big companies will rush into areas uh, at the peak of a cycle. They all buy and then they all sell. So <clears throat> the big oil companies in the late uh, 70s bought all these metal and mining companies and they just it, it became so ugly by 84 they were just you know just take it so a friend of mine was a uh, controller at arco and he got a aluminum smelter from them for zero huh. two years later it was generating a hundred million of profits <laughs> i mean how many times Bad you know it, it's just it's just classic in 1985, the dollar had gotten extremely strong, and uh, U.S. export uh, competitiveness was just uh, eviscerated. And if you'd gone into a Caterpillar dealership and said, you want me to take over your business? Here are the keys. I hate this business. The Caterpillars were given away for free. The business was going for free. <laughs> but, so uh, these opportunities don't happen all the time, uh, but when they do, it's great. Now let's look at the um, 2015. We had, of course, the big commodity boom from 2002, say, to 2011, depending on what it was. In the case of, uh, it was iron ore in some cases, it was oil in other cases, it peaked early in some cases. But as usual, the big mining companies forgot uh, asset allocation, forgot discipline, uh, invested hugely in capacity. They all were producing too much. They all were hemorrhaging. And then the management gets kicked out. New management comes in. They don't work. And another management comes in. And finally, they end up just divesting of all the stuff they paid a fortune for. So in the summer of 2015, the major uh, commodity producers were just selling stuff that they bought for 8 and $10 billion for couple hundred million, another example. Buy when they're giving it away. And that was the time to buy that whole commodity sector. It went down a little bit more for a couple of months, but that was the bottom. And you, you can see some of these uh, BHP and others are hitting new, new highs, right? Um, 
Another indicator I use is an entrenched perma bear or perma bull who gives up. Uh, Julian Robertson is a great friend of mine. He would say the same thing I'm saying. He closed his value hedge fund, which was the largest, the day the NASDAQ peaked in March 2000. Andy Hall, uh, a perma oil bull, closed his fund in August 2017 when oil was 42. Then it went up to 85. Aubrey McClendon, who, another client of mine, who um, destroyed the natural gas uh, industry by overproducing. And I warned him all the way. I said, you know, you're making a mistake here. He said, I want to kill King Cole. All right, well, he might have killed King Cole, but he killed the natural gas industry. He ran into a wall uh, and killed himself. And that day, natural gas bottomed at $1.62. So there are all these examples. So you have seen all of these ups and downs. The one that I uh, think is... Uh uh, quite amazing because I remember that very clearly in 1982 when interest rates were very high, inflation looked like it would never come down. Most people thought inflation would continue at 10, 12, 13 percent and bonds, U.S. treasuries were 14 percent, 15 percent. In Canada, they were 18 percent, 30 year bonds. 18%, you can't believe it today with the uh, 2s and 3% uh, rate, 3% rates. Um, and you wrote a book, Is Inflation Ending? This was 1982, Is Inflation Ending? Are You Ready? And I've got a copy of the book. He gave me a copy of the book. He's got one, very few copies remaining. And you wrote it with Gary Schilling, who's another contrarian like you. Right. Tell us a little about that time period and how you arrived at that. Well, the late 70s, uh, another tool I've used, and I'm not sure it still works the way it used to, is a best-selling uh, investment book, uh, Common Stocks as Long-Term Investments in 1924 became a bestseller in 1929, right? Um, so in the late 70s, the entire list was crisis investing, uh, prospering in the coming bad years, uh, you know, the dollar crisis, it was just amazing. Full page ads with these bearish Jeremiah's predicting the end of the world. And my friends would say, is there gonna be a depression? I'm saying, are you telling me in the fall of 29 there were full page ads warning about a depression? I said, this is gonna <laughs> buying opportunity of a lifetime. And equities were cheap and bonds were unbelievably cheap. And bonds were called certificates of confiscation at the moment they offered the greatest value in the history of the bond market. And what's so interesting is that I gave 500 talks at least urging people to buy long-term treasuries on margin if you had the courage to do it because short rates were going to fall and the cost of carry would collapse. You make more money actually on the positive cost of carry than you would on the appreciation. And I said that the, the highest interest rates in capitalism would go to the lowest but I never would have imagined we'd have 17 trillion of sovereign debt selling for a negative yield. So the point is you go from one extreme to the other extreme and you never know how far that extreme is gonna be. It's always farther than you ever would have imagined. Well, always the case, which uh, brings us to what you just said, 11 trillion, 9 trillion, 11 trillion of negative interest rates, sovereign bonds. We've never had that before, I don't think uh, in any, uh, historical perspective, uh, Kirill, um, in uh, the history of uh, the, the last 500 years. What's your sense as to, it's very difficult to figure out how we come out of this, and um, what's your sense of that? Well, um, QE uh, was socialism for the 1%. MMT, or uh, um, helicopter money, is the socialism for the people. And great thought leaders like Ray Dalio and others, even Warren Buffett is, is, has changed his mind that deficits aren't bad. Uh, I think there's a big shift coming uh, towards being open to literally uh, printing money and giving it to the treasury to disperse. Now, uh, Ludwig von Mises wrote in 1949 that there is no way <clears throat> for
for a credit-fueled boom to end, except two ways. One is you withdraw the stimulus, which is what QT was about, and you get a little bit of pain, and the Fed backed off, and Trump was on their case, or you destroy the currency. So who knows? That's 1949 view by Ludwig von Mises. To me, the, the malinvestment that was made under free money, we will look back on it, and we will literally shake our heads that this actually happened, and we watched it. The excesses are so enormous that our sensitivities have been desensitized. So you have, I'm not being disrespectful, but you have Ken Griffin buying, in a couple of months, the most expensive house in New York, London, and Chicago, all at the same time. And we've seen this happen so many times. We, it's just another, another disaster that, so the, the signals are all there of huge excesses, of which free money and the extreme and sovereign credit uh, is a tremendous example. So you're looking at a pretty significant recession sometime, uh, Carol, coming along? If they, if they start to, to do uh, this, um, I think you will have inflation this time around. Yeah. We will have uh, inflation, did you say? If, if they go towards the helicopter money route, Mm. And you start to see fiscal expansion. For example, Portugal is a country that's doing remarkably well. They abandoned the austerity policies that the, the uh, uh, EU required them to do. So I think the fiscal spigots are going to be opened up now because you're just not getting the growth and the populist pressure is just too great. You're going to have to start spending money. And if America starts to do it, then everybody else will start to do it. Awesome. Carol, how about the possibility that, uh, you know, that this administration has got cut taxes significantly, lowest taxes in 50, 60 years after the Second World War. Uh, business regulation is being uh, rolled back, as you know. Lots of animal spirits in the United States in terms of um, uh, the economy, 3.2%, 3.1% for last year in 2018. Um, the trade deal is a problem. Looks like he's going to solve it. And uh, first China, and then Europe. Um, and we are coming off eight long years of one to two percent economic growth under the Obama administration, right. for whatever reason. Right. Um, may, not, may there not be a runway that allows the economy to uh, continue for some time? Who knows how it'll end? But interest rates are very low. They can go up. You and I have seen interest rates very high, and companies and, um, and countries have survived. Um, I wondered what you think of that possibility. Well, if, if the Fed cuts interest rates this year once or twice, we could have a scenario. Uh, there are three historical examples where this happened. Uh, the Fed started cutting interest rates in uh, 1965. I don't precisely have it in my mind how much. And that prolonged the boom. And there was, that was a time of guns and butter because you had the war in Vietnam and you had the Great Society program by LBJ. So you had, a, you had sort of an inflationary speculative boom. Uh, that's one option. Another is the uh, Fed doubled interest rates in 1994, the worst bond market year since 28. And then the Fed started cutting rates, and then you went on for another five years. 98, um, uh, Russian uh, bankruptcy and, and long-term capital management bankruptcy. Fed eased. You had another year and a half or two. So if the Fed does ease, and this is very important because I think the Fed's very concerned about its independence. Uh, and uh, whether these two candidates that Trump has proposed get uh, approved, they're pretty radical. Uh, Steve Moore, I mean, I understand the, the concept of what he's saying, and this, it's got some merit. You know, I have to admit, reluctantly, <laughs> that it has some merit. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's an experiment, and uh, uh, so I, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. I think the Fed is very worried, very worried. 
before we open it up uh, for questions, one uh, for last one for you, uh, uh, Kirill, is you're looking at the emerging markets as an area of great opportunity in the next 10, 20, 30 years. You've said that many times. And um, just your comments on that, the emerging sure. markets, Asian sure. markets, all of the countries that are um, sure. developing and coming up. Well, you start off with valuation. Uh, and you look at the major emerging market indexes that haven't gone anywhere in 12 years. <coughs> uh, in, in 1988, I read that it took 70 years to put a landline system in the U.S. I'm sorry, in the U.K., 50 years in the U.K., uh, 30 years in Japan, and 20 years in Korea. <coughs> but you could put a, uh, a mobile phone system in one and a half years. I said, oh boy, this is great for emerging markets. And it was. And of course, from that came the internet and the explosion of networking. So now the same thing is happening with solar. So if you look at disruption, which we follow a lot because they're great shorts and they're also great longs. But if you, you, know, you tend to be uh, less interested in the new technologies and more interested in getting out of the disrupted industries, which is important to know these days, uh, <clears throat> it's a very important factor. And the utility industry... Uh, as great it is in theory, is under tremendous pressure from solar and wind and alternative energy because of the legacy system. But if you're in Africa and you don't have any legacy system, you just put in a new solar at one and a half cents. What a competitive advantage it is. So that's the first thing. Electricity prices lower will jumpstart many of these economies. The second is that <clears throat> that's where the millennial population is. That's where the young blood, that's where the demographic dividend is. Always a fuel for economic growth. The third is that there, the millennials in the emerging countries are all adopting fintech. The, the number of transactions in China of fintech are, I believe, 500 times what they are in the United States. This is an explosion. 800 million Chinese are using their mobile phone to, to buy. Uh, the next is population. That's where the population is, and that's where the economic growth is. If you grow at 5 or 6% a year, you double incomes in 12 years. So it's just a fantastic story. The other thing that's happening is that governance has improved. Obviously, it's not, it's not great, but you have people running these countries that actually are concerned about the welfare of the people. I've been not interested in Africa my entire career, and I've changed my mind. I'm quite interested in it because things are really happening there. And, of course, India, that we both like, probably is the great story of the next 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, um, <clears throat> just to pass out one more, uh, is uh, the effect of all of that could be a positive on the developed world, um, uh, Kirill, in terms of, as opposed to the developed world, bringing up the uh, emerging markets, emerging world, could the opposite take place? Yeah. I think it's very possible that capital will leave. Uh, capital is concentrated in the U.S. since 2007, $10 trillion or so. It's, it, by my way of thinking as a contrarian, it's a, it's a hugely crowded trade. And uh, what will go wrong remains to be seen. Maybe it's uh, helicopter money. Maybe it's something else. But capital will, will start to, to go out and go into these uh, emerging countries, I think, in, in, in substantial size. Kirill has, a, it just rem I remembered that Kirill has a very interesting uh, a point of view on uh, uh, capitalism and the cycle of distribution and uh, and uh, um, uh, the time when uh, the c capital can be accumulated. Um, just, um, and, uh, you know, that's very, uh, you know, these are long cycles and um, you've written about it. Uh, can you highlight that, um, um, Carol? Well, uh, I've studied history. I read uh, Will Durant's uh, History of Civilization, which is 11 volumes, uh, twice. That's what I really learned something. And that's one of the, the eternal truths of history is cycles of wealth accumulation and cycles of wealth distribution. And the reason is when you have a cycle of wealth accumulation, the best and the brightest, many people in, in this room, prime, of course, a prime example, Jeff Bezos being the most prime example, if, you, if, you, if Jeff Bezos had no restraints, he'd own the world. 
You could tie him up and put him in that corner. He still will own the world, right? You have to really keep him down. And this is what happens. The cycle comes along. Everybody gets angry. It's gone too far. Regulate these guys. Slow it down. Take away some of their money. Then they complain. And then, then you know, eventually the cycle turns. And you have another cycle. So I began in my career uh, being very involved with supply side economics and Jack Kemp. And I saw it in 1977, at which America was a socialist country. It, it, was, it was totally regulated, no venture capital, enormously high taxes. And I just felt the vibrations as America's ready to move. And um, so uh, I got involved with that. And then I understood how that was spread around the world. And we had the resulting boom. So now it's 40, 45 years later. Uh, half of America has been left behind. Uh, Ray Dalio, I don't know if you saw his piece uh, recently, gave a lot of stats on education statistics where uh, it's just, it, it's not capitalism as as it is currently working, isn't benefiting a lot of Americans. So that's the kind of pressure that, that forces a change for some kind of distribution. In the 34 years to 1980, which is this period I described, American uh, disposable income doubled. It's not necessarily bad. In fact, it's, it's quite good because it's an sh equal sharing of economic growth. So that's what I believe we're coming into, and I will watch how this transpires, you know, with the Democrats coming up with all these proposals. But, you know, you don't think about it as being socialism. It's just, it's just a normal cycle of, you know, distributing some of the huge gains in fairness. It's actually a, a good thing. So we're in the uh, distribution uh, side of the end of the cycle. I, I think so. I think so. So some of, the, some of the money that all of you will make uh, might have to be given, uh, given away. But with that, uh, why don't we open it up uh, to uh, some questions from uh, all of you. That's George. One over there and one over there. So uh, we've got about uh, 20 minutes for, for Q&A, about 20 minutes, yeah, 20, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, yeah. Further question? Over here. Yeah. yeah. Correct. You want to get the mic there? We'll Correct. go there and then we come to you. Hey, good morning. I'm Curtis Jensen. Um, thanks for your comments. Kirill, where do you, if, if I think about your comments in terms of capital flows and where do you see capital flowing away from today that could be a source of opportunity? You mean where? Uh, where is there an exodus of cap an exodus of capital from a country, an industry, or a group of industries, or something that you think maybe sets up to be an interesting set of investments? Well, uh, you be talking about a country or a sector or both? From the yeah. United States, for example, or? Uh, globally. If you see, okay. you know, if you, if you said it was. Uh, you know, aluminum or it was a commodity or just anywhere where you see capital flight and you say it's not sustainable and therefore at some point like you were talking about, well, capital may come back and make it an interesting. Commodity prices are selling at their lowest valuation since 1972. Uh, the oil sector uh, today as a percentage of the S&P is back to where it was uh, in 2002 when the oil uh, it came live after a 20 year bear market. So that whole commodity sector is enormously undervalued. And in my opinion, very <clears throat> attractive because of very long term uh, underinvestment. Oil being a, a, a case in point, gold being a case in point. I'm not talking about gold as a monetary, I'm just talking about production is peaking and demand is, is still there and increasing. So I think that's a very attractive sector. And if I'm right in emerging markets that, you know, you've got 5 billion people that are in countries that are growing 5 and 6 percent, and you'll have a whole bunch of Chinas uh, or many Chinas all over the world, that means more and more demand for all these commodities. And uh, companies are not investing because, the, the, because of the, the bloodbath that, that took place, as I described, and the new managers are listening to the shareholders and saying, don't throw the money away anymore. We want you to give it back to, to the shareholders. So I think that's a really attractive sector. You know, oil and energy is uh, very complicated. 
uh, very, very complicated, but I'll try to make it uh, simple. Um, the, because of the coming alternative fuels and the electric vehicles, the major oil companies are not investing, hugely underinvesting, and also the pressure from shareholders not to, not to, um, uh, not to make these big investment projects. Uh, so that's a that's a major uh, area, I think. Um, and I I love the cycles of too much capital and too little capital. You know, you starve something of capital investment, sooner or later, you can have a big boom. Um, China is very interesting from the standpoint of healthcare. So it's the most rapidly aging uh, country in the world. And they need massive amounts of wealth transfer to, to take care of this aging population. So I think that's a, that's a really good sector. And one question down there. Yeah, then next, next over here. Um, okay. Kira Wayne Peters from Sydney, Australia. Thank you very much for your comments. Very interesting dynamics we have around the world. I'd be interested in your views on how does Europe come out of this negative interest rate dynamic? Uh, and do you believe the euro remains in its current state? Well, um, there was a book written about 2008 based on new disclosure. And I have no reason to disbelieve it. I didn't read it, but my, one of my associates did. It was 600 pages. And arguing that the financial crisis was really about a, uh, a funding crisis in European banks to the tune of one and a half trillion. And Bernanke took it upon himself to agree to fund this. Uh, a few members of Congress were, were involved, but it, you know, it was not approved by Congress, which something like this should very much have been. So European banks have not recovered. They still have half of the way to go. That's been a big part of the problem. And um, I think also the fact that the Germans are austere by nature and they went through uh, huge austerity programs when East and West Germany merged and they feel this would be what everybody else should be doing this. Right? So now they're running trade surpluses, massive trade surpluses have for, for forever, but they have huge fiscal surpluses, enormous amount of, of, of capital to invest. Their export markets are turning down. So I, I'm convinced that Germany is going to have to make a big shift. Uh, so this example of Portugal that I gave where Portugal didn't listen to the EU and broke above its fiscal restraints uh, and uh, now is the uh, most uh, fast growing country in the EU. So I think that has to happen. Unfortunately, Brexit is, is distracting everybody here. And that's why Macron keeps saying, let's get this done and over with because we need to you know, get on with, with our own project. I, I think that Europe is going to come out of it I know the, the bearish case, um, a lot of capital left Europe to come to the United States to get the interest rate differential. That capital can come back if the Fed cuts interest rates.